This is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel, bringing you a program that's given over to painting and drawing from life. This is part two of a landscape done in palette knife, begun at another show, and it's going to be the wind-up of this composition of a uh, water scene combined with a landscape in the area of Setauket. Little Bay, of course, is part of Setauket Harbor, separated by a little inlet. Um, this was shot on a very bright, sunny day with no cloud interruptions, very little wind, and fortunately, a beautiful white sailboat moored at rest for the winter time in this charming little uh, out of the way uh, part of water uh, up on the North Shore. So um, we have all these lovely things in our environment where we live, and all we have to do is to find them, which I do, of course, uh, as often as possible, and then set about to painting them, if you are so inclined to paint. One of the reasons that I'm here is to give you some feeling of how you go about it, and what the attitude should be, and how you kind of ha can find your own expression, but with a few instructions from me with uh, style. Uh, the palette knife style is, is uh, wonderful because it uh, keeps the colors very pure. You don't have to worry about brushes and getting full of color that you don't want because all you do is to wipe clean a piece of stainless steel and then you've got a brand new uh, un uh, unfettered uh, object with which to paint. And so, and it's also very much uh, wonderful textural kind of thing. Well, uh, we've gone this far with a sky landmass in the distance, the beach type, the water scene which was done before, which is layers of blue with darker blue on top of it and paler blue on top of that. And just right now for, um, for uh, uh, just to begin uh, reworking on this, the, uh, the land is separated. There is always a rather dark uh, uh, line of, um, of a color between the land and the water. It's what happens over there. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something to be wa watched for because when you get that darker line, it's, it gives a definite separation between the land and the water. And it also is, um, is another excuse to give you that three-dimensional look whereby what is happening over there, you're not painting reeds and you're not doing a detailed study of um, beach grass, but somehow it's all suggested there with the application of certain colors. I always say keep the colors absolutely simple and very, very plain. There is over here some kind of a dock arrangement. It is so far off that I'm not sure that I can tell what it is, but I do see little, little dots of a pale color against the blue, which probably could be the pilings of a dock. Also, in the distance, there is the roof of a house. It looks like it's a pale roof, and it's right over here. I'm not going to bother to draw a roof. I'm just going to suggest it by putting a line of pale color. I'm sure that it will explain itself that this is the roof of some kind of house. This is called impressionistic painting. It has been very successful for low these hundred years. It was born in France, and um, the, uh, the painter has found himself totally intrigued with Impressionism ever since they began. Uh, also, there are some white objects in the distance way off there that can be put in merely by uh, dotting the canvas with little bits of white. They're probably 
um, boats at different angles. And this one is probably a rowboat in profile, and this is a rowboat seen uh, head on. So all of these things are just a way of, 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 of telling you how and what your, what your technique can be like once you find out just what to look for out there. Um, I'm going to be working with this land mass, which is uh, over to the left side of the, uh, of the monitor, which is, is transmitting uh, a tape, which we shot today uh, from life uh, in the morning. And that's why the light is that way. And the tide was coming in, I believe. Uh, and you'll see that this land over here, I'm going to use some of the darker color that I used before uh, to do the land mass. And here is the introduction, the beginning of a sort of a rocky, sandy, pebbly place that is part of the, um, of the, of the way the land goes off into the, uh, into the part of Little Bay. And it's, it is, it's because the water has not covered it yet, and it is now exposed. But it's the same kind of technique. Uh, to suggest that the mass is there, and then the details will come a little bit later. But you get the mass in, you get the, the composition pretty well set by putting these in. And you can very well tell that this is, this is land and this is water on either side. Uh, the last time, the last show we had, this swan was very cooperative and decided to come and, and sit right in front of us. And so here I'm going to uh, show you how you pull the color over the blue, which is still slightly wet. And it gives, you the, it gives you the kind of pebbly uh, feeling of water uh, washing over rocks. Um, it becomes rather pale, but I'm going to do that in a layer. As soon as I get the first, uh, the first color down, then the layer comes, whereby the, the, the paleness comes on top of it. As I said before, we're, we're, we are working in a technique called layering the paint. Um, the same thing happens down here. There is a dark area of where the sand kind of goes off into a, into a swirl because the wind has probably moved it that way. And it's building up towards a, uh, a marshy kind of beach, dried beach grass, a uh, uh, little mound here. Uh, the, um, and here, here's, some, here's the darkness in the distance over here. So as soon as I get that in, we'll be able to uh, introduce the uh, the paler areas, which is, which is sometimes the downfall of a seascape, is what do you do with the foreground? It's perfectly simple to do blue sky, and then the uh, horizon of the water, and then, you know, maybe suggest a few boats. But it's quite another thing to pull off a, um, a, a, a foreground. And foregrounds are something that I find not, not many programs worry about. And many times it is a terrible failure when the foreground is not dealt with uh, you know, in, a, in an interesting and also an informative way. So foregrounds can make or break a picture. And that's why I thought that it would be best to take some time with this, uh, with this, uh, this composition and show you how to work the foreground. Uh, I'm laying on what they call, what you might call, a background to receive the, um, the uh, beach grass that is, of course, in its winter uh, state. It's not standing up straight. It's lying flat because uh, it has died, and the tides have come in and gone out and uh, flattened it. Now, uh, over here, you'll notice that I have a palette knife full of pale color. Um, and I'm going to put it on with, hopefully, as few movements as possible so that you can get some feeling of this, of the interpretive quality that we're trying to get out of doing these, uh, these beachy grass things without taking out little tiny brushes and painting each and every blade of, of straw. What you're trying to do is to get a general impression of what's happening out there. And by that, you have to pay attention to the texture that you're dealing with. Um, the, the texture, of course, uh, has got a lot, a lot to do with uh, the light that's hitting it. The light is hitting the top of this area with some pale color, and so I've got some pure white that I'm putting on the top of this. And now I'm going to pull some of this pale color across and, and I hope that it gives the impression of uh, grass lying on the beach. 
Here is the uh, pale area, which is oh, almost pure white. Um, over here by the, uh, in the foreground, where the sand is actually quite bleached, and you can see from the, from the reference material that it is extremely pale, and it goes off into here, and these are the, these are the lo lovely spots that are almost unique to Long Island. Long Island has these little coves hidden away, which I have found in very few other parts of the world. That's why I always keep coming back here to find the beach scenes to paint because they are, in fact, to me, quite delicious. Um, there is a darkness to that sandy area, and it's uh, got to be mixed quite carefully. As you can see, uh, it's a predominantly tan and blue painting so far. And the tide has come up and has made this sand a little bit wet, and therefore it's a little bit darker. And um, the uh, paying attention to details like this is what gives a palette knife painting, which is impressionistic, a certain sense of realism. Um, I, will no I never do get away from the realism that I'm concerned with because I'm a realist painter. And just because you work with something as, as almost crude, as you might say, as a palette knife, doesn't mean that you sacrifice the realism. And here is the, here is a, uh, paying attention to the real, which of course you cannot do without being there. I would never attempt to think that I could remember or memorize any of this from, from memory or even from a comprehensive sketch. Working from this monitor, which incidentally I think is quite innovative, I don't think any other program is working from a monitor such as we do, and that's probably why we win prizes. And I might add that somewhere along the line there is uh, there are some awards being given very soon. We don't know the results, but we certainly hopeful that this program has helped to contribute to some of the prize winning. Uh, the emotion of this, uh, of this pale color is something that I am merely picking up from my reference. I'm not making this up. I'm not just saying, well, this is close enough. This is ex exactly what I feel I can use in the way of an interpretation of what I see. Um, there are, of course, many, many uh, twigs of grass and dried things that are in the foreground, and I'm going to mix techniques in a little while in order to be able to get the feeling for it, and by mixing techniques I'm going to put the palette knife down and I'm going to use a brush just to get the general feeling and to show you how you in fact can mix techniques quite successfully. Uh, because you work in palette knife doesn't mean that you are forbidden to use um, to use another instrument. You can use your thumb, you can use sponges, you can use anything you please to get the effect that you're after. And uh, this is the opportunity for me to show you how you can in fact use a brush to give you the uh, details of all of this uh, complicated foreground that was, is going to make this painting, uh, you know, hopefully uh, successful. Um, I've got to put a little bit of darkness here because the land seems to be going out into the water. And it also meets up here. And this is going to be ready to receive the, um, the, uh, the, the brush technique of the, uh, of the beach grass. But I, I like to keep as much of the palette knife as possible for uh, illustration that, uh, in fact, a, a painting with palette knife is entirely feasible with no introduction of any other. But uh, this time I'm going to show you how you can, in fact, change uh, um, materials. Here is a brush, obviously, and it's a nice, uh, it's called a, um, a liner brush. It's got very long, thin bristles. And it needs to be used for very long, thin techniques. So I'm going to liquefy uh, the, um, the white by putting it here. And I'm going to put a great deal of turpentine in it and turn it into a kind of an ink. There's a little bit of yellow on the palette, which is going to be picking up in the white, which is exactly what I want, because some of that beach grass is, in fact, yellowish. So with a good, you've got a nice close up there of how I, how I mix up this color. And you can see that it's getting quite liquid. And let me see whether or not I can actually give you some feeling about how this is done. Um, 
the uh, the arbitrary way in which these uh, these uh, this beach grass, this dead beach grass, is lying all over this area will show you that. Uh, but there is a pattern to it, nevertheless. Even though it looks like it's uh, sort of haphazard and just a jumble, it has got a pattern to it. Obviously, the tide came up and deposited these things in a certain way. Uh, and that's why, as a realist, and through observation, I can tell you that uh, you could not possibly invent this if you were just working out of your mind. So there you have the, um, there you have the uh, use of the brush uh, combined with the uh, palette knife. Now, the paint of the palette knife picture is extremely thick and therefore very wet, which means that this, uh, this paint will flow very nicely uh, with these tiny uh, strokes. Uh, while, uh, while I'm uh, going to uh, w wipe out this brush, I'll be right back. Don't leave us. We will wind up in just a few moments and take a short break. back again for the final denouement of this study of Little Bay in Setauket Harbor. Uh, we're dealing with the foreground, uh, a complex um, problem which faces everybody who has ever tried landscape painting, whether it's landscape, seascape, or any kind of outdoor study. Uh, there is always an enormous problem with the foreground. So that's why we're trying to deal with this. I'm, I have combined now, as, as I told you a few moments ago, brush as well as palette knife. Over in the distance of this little spit of land right here, there is, um, there is um, some, uh, some more of the, of the grass lying, uh, sort of what appears to be helter-skelter, and there is a pattern to it. The, uh, it, seems, it seems to follow a tidal pattern. So if you, and when you are out you know, studying these things, be observant as to the movement and the place in which these things lie and the and the manner in which they do lie because that's the that's the anatomy of the um of the composition there is uh, there are certain uh, absolutely unmistakable things recognizable about certain areas and the uh the recognizable thing about long island beach areas are the wonderful patterns that are made because of the way the water uh, behaves on the North Shore and the South Shore of this island. Uh, it's peculiar to Long Island. It's not found anywhere else in the world, and I paint in an awful lot of other places. And so uh, you can take it from me that um, my observations have told me that the, um, the quality of this island is very unique and also has to be very carefully observed. The, um, the um, manner in which uh, the foreground grasses lie sometimes is absolutely so perplexing that you can, in fact, just kind of uh, really interpret it and have them lay over in a cross pattern over one another, such as I'm doing here. There is, a, there is no uh, steadfast rule when you're out there observing it and seeing how it happens. Even though it may appear to be unimportant, it is very important for the final flavor of this kind of a painting. You have, um, you have uh, 
the uh, gift of being able to observe right there at the spot, uh, which is uh, what I find fault with these programs that do not go out and work from life. Uh, they are relying purely on whatever recall the human mind has, and the, uh, it is a rare mind that would have total recall for all of these details, virtually impossible. Sticking out of the water in many places are some uh, bits of beach grass that are that are you know either dead or, or dying or uh, but they are of a certain color and the color is important not green there is no green in this picture whatsoever which tells you something else about it it's a time of year the time of year is uh, early spring I think I see a slight suggestion way off there in the distance of a very very little beginning of a um, of a yellow of a tree which I think probably we ought to um, we ought to introduce a, a little bit of yellow here even though it may be slightly enhanced it's going to give you some feeling about the fact that this is the beginning of spring and but the trees are there is no green in this picture whatsoever and uh, it's always interesting to for, for me to be able to uh, talk about the fact that well here's a painting that has absolutely no green in it because I'm a, I'm a great exponent of of the use of green. Um, the boat uh, that uh, was kind enough to be moored there is um, over to the left side of the composition. I'm going to interpret it. I'm not going to attempt to make it a yacht, a, a, a yawl, um, a, a catch, or anything else. It is a white form which looks to me like a boat because it's so far away. Um, it is sitting in the water. It is in profile. There is a certain feeling that it probably is shaped something like this. It needs to have, it needs to have a reflection. And I'm going to just kind of lay this on. And the, the paint is going on extremely thick. I think that possibly if I were to, yeah, well, there it is. OK, so it has an upper deck. We see that there is an upper deck. And we see that it also has a shadow. So. The upper deck is here, and it doesn't matter how thick this paint goes on, the thicker, almost the better. Some people are really absolutely intrigued with the idea that really thick paint is put on on these paintings, and I agree. So if the boat is really thick, then so be it. Do it thick. And the side of it, as you can see, is in darkness because it's in shadow, and this, this, is, this part of the boat has turned sort of gray. I'm once again going to use my a brush to put the mast in. Now, one of the real no-nos of a, of, of a painting that has masts, uh, the sign of the amateur, the great sign of the amateur is when the mast is just too thick. And so I'm going to use another brush here as a, what is called a maul stick. It's nothing more than something upon which I can rest my hand. As you can see, I'm resting my hand on this, on this stick. Do not touch the painting with it. I'm resting it on the canvas. And I'm going to put the the uh, mast of the boat in, and it bisects the land and comes down either, I, it could be an angle or it could be uh, perfectly straight, but I think I'll just simply put it in this way and it crosses over the other ones and that should be a fairly acceptable mast at this point. Um, maybe uh, there is too much that's hitting this, so I'll take that out. And uh, that's probably all one would need to do to show that that is, in fact, a boat sitting out there in the water. There are a few little, there is a little window that is visible in this house. All you need is a dot to show it because uh, we are not doing a study of the house. We're doing a, an impression of the entire scene. The roof, however, is dark and it can be put in in a much darker tone. And there is the, there is the thickness of the house right uh, with a brush. There are some times that you simply cannot do these details without some, without some help of a smaller instrument. Well, uh, down here there seem, uh, there, there is also, oh my, that wonderful swan was just about flying at that point. Um, I've got to put to introduce some darker tones here in the in the uh, in the foreground down here on the lower right because there are in fact um, great black and dark uh, twigs and things lying on the beach and this is where you might say 
a brush technique comes in very handy. Uh, I did paintings like this years and years ago and they are still very acceptable. They're also still in very good shape because the paint is so thick it can't be, I mean you can dust this picture for the next hundred years and never, and never disturb the texture of the paint. Um, a few details here of this wonderful movement that is taking place in this, in this uh, foreground here. And I'm going to sign this before the program goes too far. Many times I simply don't have the time to sign it. And signatures are important. If you want to make uh, any kind of a statement, you must sign your pictures as best you can. Try to, you must practice it. I, of course, practiced it for a long time. And down here usually is the place in which you put it, the lower right-hand corner. And you, you must use a fine brush. You reduce the paint to the uh, consistency of ink. You usually use a darker color, and uh, it's always nice if you can possibly sign something in your own handwriting. It's a, it's, um, it's a lot to ask of the people who are just beginning, but a badly signed painting is an amateurish piece of work. So uh, the signature is equally as important as the rest of it. Uh, the interesting and amusing thing I think I always tell people to do when they start to learn about paintings and painters is to find painters and study their signatures. Uh, someday I will do a little dissertation on the signatures of painters. Uh, most, most paintings are signed by the year, so I'm going to sign this, which is uh, 1990. That means that if this painting is, this uh, lesson is seen again in 10 years from now, we'll know exactly when it took place. Well, Time, of course, as usual, has run out. Uh, I'd like to be able to get a little bit of reflection of that boat in as the program comes to an end, which merely means to take my very fine palette knife, which is now nice and clean. I believe you can see it shining in the light. I'm going to pick up some, some white, uh, some pure white, and I'm going to run a little, a little line underneath this boat for a reflection. But you don't need much. It can be extremely subtle, and it can be virtually not hardly even there. But I know it's there. And I also wanted you to know that it was there, that reflections, uh, no matter how minuscule they are, are very important. Well, this is it. The study of Little Bay in Setauket, done in palette knife, on a beautiful early, early spring day from the monitor. Thank you for watching. I hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions, write to me, care of Channel 6, here at Cablevision. This is Pat Windrow saying bye-bye and come again. <laughs>